Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, on this day you opened the way of eternal life to every race and nation by the promised gift of your Holy Spirit. Shed abroad this gift throughout the world by the preaching of the gospel, that it may reach to the ends of the earth through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost had come, the disciples were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, 
Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last day it will be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and young men shall see visions, and old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord.
reading from the letter to the Romans. All who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of the Lord.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. And I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was a senior in high school, every member of our small graduating class and our parents were given the short book, Transitions, Making Sense of Life's Changes, by William Bridges. Even back then, that little book had proved its staying power. I think that we were given the 20th anniversary edition, meaning that the book's wisdom was far older than we were. And the version that I now gift to graduating seniors is the 40th anniversary edition, which tells you something about how old I am, first of all, but also uh, <laughs> that the book probably has something pretty good to say. Transitions was first conceived as a corporate management tool, though the end result was perhaps too personal for most businesses. So it's found its ways into schools and nonprofits and counseling offices. You may have run into it at some point yourselves. The premise of the book is pretty simple. Every human life and every community and organization that human beings are part of experiences times of transition. Some of these transitions are practically universal and part of the course of human development, 
For example, our class was given this book because we were encountering the transition from childhood to adulthood. Most of us were leaving home for the first time. And our parents were transitioning from parenting children to parenting adults. Marriage, changing jobs, moving houses, losing parents, divorce, retirement. Every life change is a life transition, the book proposes, meaning that it's less of an event and more of a process. And every transition has a predictable pattern. Something ends before something else begins. The wise administrators at my Jesuit high school wanted our class to read this book so that we could be mindful of the transition that we were in the midst of, attentive to all of the spiritual work that accompanies endings and beginnings. We can't fully embrace or appreciate a new season of life if we don't recognize and grieve the ending that precedes it. Grieving the loss of what was is important even in happy and welcome life transitions. And so this book helped us understand all of that while giving us a common language to share with our parents whose grief and anticipation looked a little bit different than ours did. My main takeaway from this book, though, all of these years later, which I now use with search committees and vestries as they experience pastoral transition, is that while every life transition includes an ending and a beginning, it also includes a critical third phase, the middle phase. Bridges calls this poetically, I think, the fallow season. The fallow season. The time between end and beginning. And we have no choice but to pass through it as we wait to reorient our lives to the next thing. In today's reading from the Acts of the Apostles, we meet the Holy Spirit for the first time. That elusive third member of the Trinity makes her appearance during the Jewish Festival of Weeks, a spring feast celebrating the harvest of barley, as well as the giving of the law. But the disciples are not celebrating that feast themselves. They are locked in a room in Jerusalem, praying ceaselessly and waiting for a promise to be fulfilled, waiting to make sense of all of the ways that their lives had been changed in such a short amount of time and all that will be asked of them moving into the future. The disciples are in a fallow season, an in-between time. Something amazing has just ended. Their journey with Jesus began on the seashore, in streets and in gardens. They walked beside him and listened to his life-altering message about the kingdom of God. They stood alongside him as he performed miracles. They ate and drank with him, celebrated and grieved. The disciples bore witness at the foot of the cross. They scattered after his execution. They marveled at his resurrection. And then they spent 40 days in his company before he was swept up to heaven in a great cloud. Their necks straining skyward, they knew of only one thing. They would receive the Holy Spirit any day now. And then, then they would bring the message of Jesus to the ends of the earth. I imagine the disciples in the upper room. The noise of the festival on the streets below them creeps through the windows and through their locked doors. A din of celebration haunts their confusion and grief. What will happen next, they wonder. What will this Holy Spirit be like? Will Jesus keep his promise? All of their senses are buzzing, ignited as they strain to pick up on any clue that this new iteration of God's presence is among them. And then, a great rushing wind blows through the door. Tongues of fire dance on their heads. They have new ears. They have new voices. 
Today, the Feast of Pentecost is our annual remembrance of this astonishing transition. When the incarnate Jesus returns to God the Creator, he sends the Holy Spirit to inspire and inform the church on earth. This is the fulfillment of the, prof- of the promise that we just heard Jesus make in the Gospel of John at the Last Supper, just before his arrest and crucifixion. As the disciples try to wrap their heads around Jesus' assertion that he and the Father are one and that they will soon be together, he tells them that he will send an advocate, the Holy Spirit, to be with them forever. This is the spirit of truth, Jesus says, whom the world cannot receive. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. The Gospel of John is not interested in articulating a clearly formed theology of the Trinity. The church wouldn't battle that out for hundreds of years to come. John is interested, however, in the quality of Christian community, in how Jesus will not abandon the church by departing to God's right hand, but will instead continue to animate the church through God's own spirit. The church is not left alone. The disciples are not left alone. We are not left alone. John helps teach us that the Holy Spirit will always bear witness to Jesus, who is the truth. And the church can always recognize the Holy Spirit whenever the teachings and example of Jesus are made manifest in our communities whenever we are inspired to act in accord with Christ's teaching, teaching that Jesus tells us the world, the empire, cannot recognize, namely compassion and love. When that happens, we can spot the Holy Spirit's activity in our midst. My interest in fallow seasons and in-between times persists not just because of my ministry working with parishes in transition, but really just because I think they're so common and also so commonly misunderstood. We can all point to times in our lives when we have felt a little out of sync with any sense of greater purpose. When the next thing that we long for hasn't quite materialized even though we left some older version of life behind. These fallow seasons can be hard and confusing, and I know for a fact that just as we experience them as individuals, we also experience them collectively, at work, at school, in church, in the shifts and changes of our nation and our world. But I also know from experience, and now also from Holy Scripture, that these middle phases are incredibly rich. It is right in these in-between places where God is known to powerfully show up. There have been many times in these 50 days of Easter that I have found myself wondering where God is. Some of these times have been personal moments of indecision or confusion where the right way forward feels unclear. Some have been from the distance of a friend's pain or sadness, circumstances of brokenness and hardship that are hard to find an easy answer. Sometimes have been at work. Sometimes have been in front of the evening news or over the paper weeping or raging over stories so tragic that I cannot understand them. I have certainly felt like those early followers of Jesus, praying in the upper room on Pentecost, the very ones who watched him ascend into the sky. Where is Jesus now? Will he keep his promise? Of all the things we celebrate on Pentecost, I want to remember this. The promise of the Holy Spirit, the advocate, 
the living power of God, did not come first to a group of courageous, organized, perfectly faithful people who had it all together. The promise of the Holy Spirit did not come to a community already living with confidence in the full potential of a new beginning. No. The promise was kept in the midst of confusion and fear. The promise came to the ones who were unsettled and unsure, the ones who were doubting, the ones who still showed up and prayed. My friends, life is full of transitions, ones that are welcome and ones that are not. We will find ourselves in fallow seasons over and over again. When that happens, remember the upper room. Remember God's promise of companionship, God's track record of keeping promises, and keep listening for that rushing wind. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. Those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Scott, our bishop, Elizabeth, our canon, Vanessa, our dean, Kate, our priest associate, Ellen and Lisa, our deacons, and Teresa, our diocesan deacon, and for all bishops and ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. For our congregation, Church of the Holy Spirit in Bellevue, St. Thomas Church and Divine Providence Church in the Dominican Republic, for Debbie, Joan, Tom, Christian and family, 
Virginia, Beth, Lillian, the people of Ukraine, the family of Sarah Selgren. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Evan Chapel, all who have died in the service to our country. Terry L. Bruner, Sr. Sarah Selgren. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Trinity on this beautiful Pentecost morning. Oops. We want to welcome all who are with us this morning, whether you are physically present in the church, whether you are on the live stream. We welcome you if you are visiting with us, if this is your first time with us, if you've lost count of how many times that you've been with us. And we welcome you especially to join us for communion it is God's table, and all are truly welcome. If you wish to receive the bread, you can do so either at the rail, standing or kneeling, or at the station, which is down here below the lectern, by simply extending your open palms for the bread. And if you wish to join us in communion but not receive, you are also welcome to come forward for a blessing, which you would indicate by crossing your hands over your heart, and you will receive one. We also want to welcome this morning our new curate, Reverend Deacon Lisa Aguilar. Lisa will be with us for the next 18 months, participating in the life of the cathedral, serving first as a deacon and then being ordained priest and will remain with us in that capacity as well. Also want to welcome her husband, Matt, and her three children who are with us this morning. Welcome to you as well. Lisa will be mentored by our clergy and will bring her gifts to contribute to our common life, especially in the area of family and children. And so please introduce yourself to her at coffee hour, get to know her. We are delighted to have you and your family with us. As always, many things are going on here at Trinity and as always, many of them are related to music. So I'm going to ask Alex to make some music announcements. Good morning. We uh, have the start, well, let's, let's start from the very beginning. So next week on Trinity Sunday, we will offer a choral prelude starting at 10 o'clock in the morning, and it'll be done around 10.20. Uh, so please come and enjoy that special music. Then the following Sunday, uh, June 19th, we begin summer choir. So if you are somebody who's interested in singing in summer choir, Come as you are, we shall welcome you with open arms. Uh, the Trinity Youth Chorale is up to 18 members now. I gained two from last week. There are handbooks in the back of the church, so if you have interested singers, uh, please take one. The entire schedule for the year is located in the back of that. Uh, but again, that ensemble is open to grades 7th through 12th, and we're welcoming singers from across the diocese. Uh, this fall, because we're always planning ahead in music, if you would like to be one of our volunteer singers in the cathedral choir, 
please email me. The year, we've got some highlights in the bulletin, but our first rehearsal is August 31st, and then we're gonna go through June 4th, Trinity Sunday 2023, and we'd love to have some new faces join us. Thank you. And Deacon Allen also has an announcement. And finally, we are aware that we were remiss last week in acknowledging the Memorial Day Remembrance and all who are remembered on that day for the great sacrifices that they've made, home and health and life, and all of the things in service to their country. So Dean Vanessa has written a letter to the congregation that she has asked me to read to you today. She wrote, Dear Trinity Cathedral Community, Last Sunday, I failed in my planning to include a Memorial Day acknowledgement. Please accept my heartfelt apology for any injury that I caused. The astonishing sacrifice of America's soldiers, sailors, and airmen was evident to me as a child growing up in a hostile part of the world. The naval presence in the Persian Gulf made all the difference to our safety in Saudi Arabia. Both of my godparents are career military officers, and my family is replete with military service in battle. In any death, the church's role is to give comfort, lift up the departed souls, and declare resurrection. The death of our soldiers, sailors, and airmen holds personal grief for those who have lost loved ones and national humility in remembering it is we, the citizenry, who choose our wars. It is vital that Trinity acknowledge the sacrifice of our war dead, lift their souls in humble gratitude, and reflect on our role in their sacrifice with humility, Dean Vanessa. And she asks that we please say together this morning the, serve, the prayer for heroic, thanksgiving for heroic service that you will find on page five of your bulletin. Let us pray. O oh, judge of the nations, we remember before you with grateful hearts the men and women of our country who in the day of decision ventured much for the liberties we now enjoy. Grant that we may not rest until all the people of this land share the benefits of true freedom and gladly accept its disciplines. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now if you would please stand and join in singing hymn 719 in your hymnal.
Remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, little children, love thee one another.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and grace. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. In fulfillment of his true promise, the Holy Spirit came down on this day from heaven, lighting upon the apostles to teach them and lead them into the truth, uniting peoples of many tongues in the confession of one faith, and giving to your church the power to serve you as a royal priesthood and to preach the gospel to all nations. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation by him and with him and in him in the unity of the holy spirit all honor and glory is yours almighty father now and forever Amen. and now as our savior christ has taught us we are bold to say our father 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Hallelujah.